Greetings, film fans, and welcome back to the following feature podcast. I'm your host, Arthur Wilde, and I apologise that it's been two weeks since my last episode. I know that kind of sounds like I'm just about to stand up at Alcox and Omis and say, it's been two weeks since my last drink. It hasn't. It's been longer. However, let's move forward. Now, apologies, yeah, I was supposed to get one out last week. I was promising a Halloween special, but unfortunately, I did have a bit of a problem where my laptop just died. And when I die, I mean it actually died. There was no repairing it. It had to be scrapped. Um, so here we are, we're back, and uh, I'm going to have a little bit of an extra long episode for you today. We're going to be reviewing five films instead of the usual three. Um, that's just basically because I've got a little bit of catching up to do. Um, if you're not aware already, this is a weekly podcast, when I manage it. And uh, each week I try to break down the latest film news and gossip, um, and then we try to review some films which are currently available to watch. And that may be on viewing platforms, it may be on TV channels, it may be at the cinema, but right now it's definitely not at the cinema. Um, really going to be missing that at the moment, but uh, hopefully it's only for a month or so. Uh, hopefully we can get back in the cinemas before Christmas. We've got some good films coming out before Christmas, but um, we'll get that one, get onto that a little bit later on. Um, in fact, what is the big film coming out? I think, yeah, Wonder Woman 1984. Apparently still coming out Christmas Day, um, but lots of films are getting cancelled left, right and centre. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's just jump straight in to the news. And where else do we start? I know it's not exactly film news, but Joe Biden has become the 46th president-elect of the United States of America. And it's huge. It's huge because at a point where the country had basically, they'd chosen a leader who didn't represent their best values, um, hadn't really done much for the economy, was pretty much destroying the image of what America had built itself to be. And um, yeah, had taken a huge step backwards. But now luckily there is a new president in place. I'm not going to say that he's perfect. Um, God knows he'll probably be involved in all kinds of things that still make him and every American leader um, somewhat, you know, despicable in regards to the uh, the conflicts they're involved in. But hey, that's getting too far into politics now. That's not what this podcast is all about. It's just a pure fucking relief that the, the fucking Cheeto King himself is no longer going to be barraging the world with his bullshit. Um, we'll still have to put up with it, but we can kind of just shrug it to one side now. It's not an international incident every time he opens up his fucking Twitter account. Um, still got 90 days left of the president, so we'll see how much he fucks things up in the meantime. But we can we can look forward to, um, I don't know, something close to normalcy? I don't, I don't even know. I can't really remember what that is anymore with the, the way 2020 is gone. What, what is normal life because i don't think it'll ever be the same um but we'll see we'll see um but congratulations um a record-breaking amount of people voted um he is uh the the most voted for president in uh, u.s history and trump is the second highest um vote recipient um even though he came second um, it was an, an amazing turnout in America, and it really shows that when everyone, or at least the majority of people, participate in democracy, it can work. Although, you know, yeah. It's it's it's, it's not something I, I really should be getting into, into on this podcast. I get enough complaints about how political I get. Um, but yeah, it's just, how can we not mention that? How can we not mention that Trump has finally been ousted? Um, so yeah, interesting one to watch, but, um, a, a huge relief, I think, for, for people with any degree of dignity or decency or just, you know, compassion, all of, all of that stuff just, it's been missing for a while now. And, um, and you know what? I can't help but think if America can do it, so can we, uh, I'm not really sure what our choices are, but, um, We'll see. All right, let's let's move on from the politics bullshit. Let's get back into movie news. Let's talk about movie kind of stuff. And there is something very huge that we need to discuss this week. Sean Connery has died. Now, 
this came as a a, a, a left hook, a sucker punch from from nowhere, um, and it really was quite devastating. But then it's it's always one of those things where you're like, oh my god, that's that's so tragic. Then you hear their age. Sean Connery was ninety years old, lived from nineteen thirty to twenty twenty. That's pretty good innings. You got to you gotta remember that this is a guy that. Um, was a heavy drinker, uh, smoked a lot of his life, um, you know, wasn't necessarily George Best style off the rails, but um, he had the sort of uh, kind of lifestyle of that era that meant that, you know, he, he could have shuffled off this mortal coil many, many years earlier. And he's had a good life, and he passed away peacefully uh, in his sleep, I believe, in his home in the Bahamas. So, not the worst death. I mean, you don't want him to die. You don't want anyone to die, really. But we all want um, a happy, peaceful death that is at the end of a long and contented life of um, achievement and success and love and happiness. And from what we could tell, Sean Connery um, enjoyed an abundance of all of those things. But he also managed to gift us with his acting talent. And, um, you know, he played Bond in six films, including an additional one, uh, the unofficial Never Say Never Again, which actually was a remake of Thunderball. Yeah. Um, he was knighted in 2000, and he was also nominated as Scotland's greatest living national treasure in 2011. Um, he officially retired from acting in 2006, but returned to do voiceover work in 2012. Um, yeah, a, a, a much admired actor. Um, you know, one of the one of the the a uh, quite a legendary st- uh, actor you know it, not just for the bond films but obviously he also did um uh, indiana jones and the last crusade um he was fantastic in uh the rock with nicolas cage um and various other films like he's he's had an extraordinary career um mostly known for bond though and you know if anyone does an impression of bond you don't find many of them doing their best roger moore or timothy dalton I don't think I've ever heard anyone doing a Daniel Craig impression. But if you're doing Bond, what was the voice you put on? Well, of course, it's this one. Yes, Bond. James Bond. 007 license to kill. Yeah, mine's terrible too. We all do terrible Sean Connery voices. But that's what Bond has become. And I used to always love the fact that on the posters, like the original one, like on Doctor No and Goldfinger, it said, Sean Connery is James Bond. And then the loving little touch on the Roger Moore posters where it just says, Roger Moore as James Bond. Subtle difference, but I think we can all agree Connery was probably the best Bond there ever was. Um, I don't want to get into the rankings of that right now because it's it's a very subjective subject. And you, you can get into all kinds of arguments. For me, Connery was Bond. Um, and I absolutely love Daniel Craig as Bond as well. I think Timothy, Timothy Dalton was um, the most underutilized Bond and, and could have definitely done a f- more than the two films that he did. Um, George Lazenby was an interesting um, choice of Bond. I think he did a great job in that in the role. He was a good actor and being, um, I think, a world karate champion as well. He certainly lived up to the physical expectations, but uh, I think they kind of tarnished his role with a couple of cheeky fourth wall breaks. Um, and... Yeah, Roger Moore, just a little bit, I don't know, pompous, um, not exactly an action star. I, I, you know, his films were decent, and I did enjoy them growing up, but uh, an older me fails to appreciate them as much as I do some of the other actors. Um, who have I missed? Sean Connery, George Lazenby, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton. Oh, Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan. Yeah, he was a decent Bond, wasn't he? Although his films got just stupid. Um, Bond in the 90s was a terrible, terrible thing. GoldenEye was good, but... Anyway, I digress. Sean Connery has left us. um, And he will be very much missed. Um, A great, great talent. And uh, I'm thinking... Next week I might... I might... I'm not necessarily thinking of doing a Bond special. I might do a Connery special. Because I've really got an overwhelming urge to watch Goldfinger. Um, and it's the only Connery Bond film I've got on Blu-ray. Uh, and it's one of those things as well. Sometimes you find that you look at your collection, you think, that's a good collection of films. And then someone like Sean Connery dies, and you're like, 
I only own three Bond films on Blu-ray. That's just not good enough. Um, but, you know, I can't keep up. Uh, I remember, like, sort of building my DVD collection and looking longingly at my VHS collection and thinking, here we go again. And then it, soon after that, we got Blu-rays coming out and I'm just doing the same thing again. And I think I've been reluctant to buy too many Blu-rays because I just worry that the next format will come along. Um, you know, I, I th the thing is, though, the next format's pretty much going to be cloud-based. So having physical anything might be completely pointless. I don't know. I still like to look adoringly at my bookshelf with all its books and DVDs and CDs and Blu-rays and VHSs and other random trinkets. Um... My book collection makes absolutely no sense. I'm just looking at it right now. There's a Mighty Boosh book followed by uh, Spike Milligan's Nursery Rhymes. There's some Walking Dead graphic novels. There's an autobiography from Gary Neville followed by the Shakespeare collection. And then so on and so forth. It's just a bizarre random collection of stuff. Um, but yeah, might need to invest in more Bond films. Um, but definitely considering doing Goldfinger next week. If you've got a Sean Connery film you think I'd, I should review, let me know. Um, there's a few of his classic um, war films and stuff that... I should really take a look at. Um, and maybe I'll look at Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade as well, because it's a classic. It's such a great, great film. And uh, he gives a, a, a brilliant performance there as um, Indiana Jones's father. So, yeah, watch this space and we'll see what's going on next week. We'll see if my computer, my brand new, spanking, shiny, sticker-free laptop actually survives a week. We'll see. Anyway, in more news, as you may have heard... Johnny Depp has left the Fantastic Beasts franchise. After losing his libel case against the press for labelling him as, a, as guilty of domestic violence, he was asked to resign from the film by Warner Brothers. And as filming is well underway for the third instalment in the Harry Potter spin-off series, this has resulted in further delays to the production, as the role will now be recast. So basically, whilst they were looking to possibly get the film out by the end of this year, obviously that got held up. Um, and filming just resumed in autumn. Um, and they were saying they are going to go for a 2021 re re release, but now things have to be brought back to the very, very beginning, and um, they need to pretty much do a restart um, with a, a new character playing Grindelwald, which, I don't know, it's not really something that happens very often these days, that characters get recast in major franchises. But considering... Um, that the second one, um, The Crimes of Grindelwald, was actually quite a flop. Uh, for them to recast the one actor that was really the biggest draw of the film, Johnny Depp, I'm I'm just not so sure about the direction that the franchise is going in. Um, first of all, I'm not entirely convinced that the allegations put against Johnny Depp were um, accurate or true, uh, based on just all of the accounts I've heard from people close to him. Um, we, we will never really know what actually happened between them, but from all the witnesses, it seems like uh, Johnny was actually the victim in this in this case. Um, but the current political and sociological climate, it's very hard for um, a man to really kind of put himself out there as the victim. I'm not trying to say that... Um, anything negative about the Me Too movement, I think it's been one of the most crucial things to happen to, to the world in the last 20 years, um, or in the last God knows how long. It's just been, it's a very well overdue situation. And we're seeing some something of a sociological revolution now in regards to how different um, people are being treated. Uh, but domestic abuse, domestic abuse against men is something that is very much overlooked. Um, it is something that is considered like, there's so much more, uh, so many more cases of domestic abuse against women, and it's been such a, a long-standing and, um, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's it's such a huge problem that um, it, sometimes it's seen as as people or chauvinistic men trying to um, draw attention away from true cases by trying to even the, the 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 playing ground and say like you know we're all in this together we're all suffering the same kind of thing and it kind of cheapens the arguments that women have been um making for a long time and, and trying to get their message across so i mean it's a fucking minefield of a subject to go through because you know 
we we don't know what really happened. Um, we've seen the pictures of him all beaten up and bruised. We've seen uh, the horrible pictures of you know the finger hanging off because of the vodka bottle she threw at him. Um, and there's there's so much going on there that it just I could understand why Johnny was so um, passionate about you know clearing his name um, in regards to what happened, uh, but. I find it very surprising that although he failed to win his libel case, um, Warner Brothers have decided to see that as, I don't know, further evidence of his um, violence towards uh, or or domestic abuse that he um, leveled towards his partner. I don't know. I don't know. But I think their their attempt to um, circumnavigate this negative press by putting the focus on a new actor in a new position. I think for a franchise that's on its knees, I think it could end up being the final nail in the coffin. Um, I don't know who's going to want to take his place um, because it's it's going to be very difficult to kind of step into a role that someone, a great character actor like Johnny Depp has, has created um, and try to do it justice whilst still being your own person. Um, yeah, what a weird situation. Uh, but we'll we'll see we'll see what happens. It's one to watch. But again, um, the first Fantastic Beasts film I found fun. I found it you know it was a nice film. It didn't really kind of capture me. Uh, and I mean I wasn't a huge fan of the Harry Potter franchise. Um, but yeah, I just I, I felt like sort of the Fantastic Beasts film, whilst it had some charm to it, it was kind of capitalising on the success of its of the Harry Potter films and uh, the sequel the sequel I don't know if you've seen it was just filler really it was one of the most eventless films with such little plot um and a lack of any real drama or action I don't know I just I just felt like it was half arsing it and what we'd eventually see was everything coming together in the third film but now that's been tainted with the um you know the, the the story going around about what's happened with Johnny Depp and the recasting of the most popular actor in the franchise, and I don't know. We'll see what happens, but uh, if Fantastic Beast does end up getting finished, um, expect it to be the last of that franchise. Expect it to be tied up and there to be no loose ends because I can't see it going beyond a third film. I don't know. Maybe I'll be wrong. Um, In our next bit of news, actually talking about franchises, uh, the next Bond is probably going to be a white guy. Now, whilst there's been uh, a weird buzz this week about Lashana Lynch's character Nomi being the new 007 in No Time to Die, uh, there seems to be a misunderstanding about what that means for the franchise going forward. The story will find Bond having left active service and having to work alongside his successor in the 00 department. However, as some have speculated that Nomi might be replacing Bond, I'm sorry to say that is not the case. Although a strong performance could herald a potential spin-off, the front-runner to play in the secret agent uh, post-Daniel Craig remains Tom Hardy. Um, King Arthur's Charlie Hunnam has also been looked at uh, in the iconic role, but he himself has agreed that Hardy is the most likely to be cast as Bond. Now, there's been a bit of confusion this week, and, and, and mostly it comes from the fact that some people have... I mean, and it was already announced earlier in the year, like seven or eight months ago, that um, the character of Numi is going to be... Uh, or Nomi is going to be um, 007. She takes his place after he steps down from the position. But once he becomes entile, in, in, entangled in uh, um, an international uh, search for a, a missing scientist... Um, British intelligence does also get involved and there is some kind of clashing between the new and the old 007s. Um, Now, some people have taken this story as, you know, as some kind of virtue signalling that they're going to make the new Bond a black woman just so it's not a white man. They're going to go for the exact opposite. Um, And that story has kind of picked up a bit of pace um, because people are stupid and prejudiced and misogynistic and racist that's where that all comes from so it's fueled this speculation that she's going to be the new bond obviously she's not um but 
she she could have uh you know if her character is strong and i've heard good things about her performance in the film if she does have a very strong character in this let's not rule out the fact that there could be a spin-off series um and we've expected there to be a spin-off series from the bond franchise for well let's face it about 70 fucking years um no actually when did when did dr no come out it was the early 50s wasn't it it's been a long fucking time um so there is definitely room to expand the universe there and have stories beyond it a bit like um you might not have seen the ill-fated uh, tv series treadstone which was um an expansion of the jason bourne um universe and there is definitely room for that um in britain we've had a lot of different spy film spy series uh, and a, a dramatic series on a major streaming network of a, something in the Bond world, for me, sounds like a fucking great idea. So, yeah. Maybe, maybe, I, I don't really know how that'll work. I don't really know what, because, I mean, I haven't seen the film yet, so I don't really know what happens to the characters or how, they're, uh, how they develop or what happens to them. I mean, for all we know, she doesn't even survive the film. We don't know. Um, but when Bond is recast, you know, you'd, you'd imagine most of the rest of the cast will be recast so her storyline might not be canon anymore um so whether she does get a spin-off series i don't know i'm speculating at the moment but i think it's a good idea and i would like to see maybe the likes of netflix or amazon prime maybe even apple they're they're a contender now as well um developing some kind of series based in you know the world of the double o operatives i mean we have only really know much about 007. We've seen other double agents uh, pop up in other Bond films in supporting roles, but there's room. There's room for like a, a 003 TV series. How does that sound? Would you watch that? I fucking would. And, you know, without really kind of treading on um, any, you know, characters that fans have been in love with for more than half a century, you can really cast any character anyone can be another agent uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a white guy every single time so watch this space we'll see what that turns into but yeah also charlie hunnam's bond i'm not sure i mean i quite liked him in the gentleman and he is a decent actor his accent's kind of all over the place because of the amount of different accents he's done filming and it's one of those things that if you're not aware of this um, you're, you can train your accent to be completely different. Like, I never used to sound like this. I'm originally from southwest London, um, and I was brought up by Irish parents. So when I first moved um, to um, the area I live in now, uh, I had what most people believed was, like, some kind of Australian with a stroke accent. Um, it was very kind of mixed up, kind of Cockney Irish kind of weird thing going on. It's not even, like, distinctly Irish as well, because my dad's from the south my mum's from the north so it's just two very distinct irish accents with southwest london mixed in there no one knew what i was saying so i trained myself or at least i i worked on my speech to ensure that i could communicate with people clearly and now i sound like this good thing bad thing i don't know um but with charlie hunnam uh he spent i think seven or eight years in america playing um this american character and it really had a knock on his accent. You know, he was he had a bit of a twang. And this is a guy that was a, like former Londoner or Geordie. Or, he was kind of all over the place. And so now he'd have to actually train himself to sound more British. Um, but yeah, he's definitely got the acting chops. He's definitely got the action chops as well. Um, but whether he's definitely a Bond, I don't know. For me, still, my favourite uh, choice of actor would be Tom Hiddleston. Him or Michael Fassbender, I think, would make fantastic bonds. But we'll see. We will see. Now, in other Disney-related news... Were we talking about Disney? No. Let's talk about Disney. Uh, Disney has pushed upcoming movies Free Guy and Death on the Nile off its release schedule completely. Whilst Kenneth Branagh's murder mystery sequel was due to be released a couple of weeks ago, Ryan Reynolds' action comedy was still due for release on December 11th. 
There are no details about when these will be released, although there are talks that both will be released exclusively on Disney Plus in the same way that Mulan was. More about that later. The success of which is still hard to measure, but it is seen as the best way forward um, in the, the, the House of Mouse, act, so it can still make some money um, from films that would normally have a, a big cinematic release. In fact, many investors have urged Disney to push many of their delayed films to VOD um, to increase the subscription rates of their streaming service if they truly want to rival the likes of Netflix. So don't be surprised if one or, or both of these are released online before Christmas. Um, I mean, if you think about it, like with all of the big films that are being released on uh, Amazon Prime, um, Amazon Prime just dropped the big Borat movie. Uh, Netflix just had um, the big Aaron Sorkin film, uh, Trial of the Chicago 7, which we'll be talking about later on. Um, you know, these are big releases. And so far, Disney's big release on its streaming platform has been Mulan, but hidden behind a, a paywall. So you had to, you, you were charged extra for it. Um, you know, it's had some kind of success, but the thing is, with the the big streaming companies, especially with Netflix, the, the king of the streamers, um, with them having just one service, just one subscription rate, and everything's inclusive, they're, they're basically opening up their entire world of film and TV to all of their audience. Um, and one of the problems with having an extra, like, sort of exclusive, um, you know, preview price, like pay for it before it's made public, um, it kind of basically gives people categories. It kind of says, like, kind of, well, you know, if you've got money, you can watch things early. If you don't have money, you'll have to wait. Um, and for some, you know, I know that's a bit of a kind of stretch there to say that it's some kind of elitism or classism that's being involved, but... You've got to be careful that you don't ostracize a certain demographic um, and also that you don't um, put yourself up to uh, be targeted by video pirates. Um, and that's something that um, Netflix, you know, have gone really far in being able to like sort of stop um, or at least slow down the, the, the world of pirating uh, by getting things out there on demand and available instantly for people to watch whenever and wherever. You know, it's it's been huge for filmmakers. And that's why Netflix pays so much. They want exclusive um, things to be, like, shown on their channel. The Trial of Chicago 7, that was supposed to be a cinematic release. Um, you know, and the thing is, with Disney, they've got so many films sitting on the back burner. They've just shelved so many films right now. Because um, don't forget... They also own the Marvel films, um, as well as the Pixar films, um, so not just the Disney films. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on them. With Free Guy, Death of the Nile, basically. I haven't, I haven't seen um, uh, Murder on the Orient Express yet. Uh, I was kind of bitter about that because I was supposed to be doubling for Kenneth Branagh on that film. And at the last minute, they decided to go with someone independently. And yeah, I was supposed to spend five or six months filming it in England and Malta, and I was really kind of gutted that I didn't get to do that. But, hey, such is life. Now, um, so I haven't seen that yet, but, I mean, you know, they're making a sequel. There was a lot of success around the first one, so um, there will be a draw for that, but I don't necessarily think that um, it's something that people are desperate to see at the cinema. And I think if you're going to try to get some films out before Christmas and try to make a little bit of money or kind of increase your subscription rate, especially around Christmas where everyone wants to sit down and watch films together. Um, if you want to get more people subscribing to Disney+, Plus, you'd put that out so that people can just watch it and not behind another paywall. Just release it for people to watch as and when they want. Um, the same with Free Guy. Everyone loves Ryan Reynolds at the moment. And everyone was looking forward to seeing this big comedy action romp on the big screen. Um, but with people not being able to go back to cinemas and with lots of cinemas having to close as a result... It's. I think it's huge that they can actually put this film out so that people can enjoy it before Christmas. You know, there's still there's still the possibility that they can release it at the cinema. There's still going to be a period where the cinemas start to reopen and people are adjusting to, you know, um, releasing from lockdown. Um, and there's going to be a lot of films there that can be released. But I think if you're going to wait... For that box office, you need to learn the lessons from the likes of Tenet and um, uh, Unhinged and 
uh, new mutants and stuff like that. Uh, you need to see their returns and how how dismal they were. Um, I know that people will still come back and watch the films on the big screen if they get the chance. Because when people come back to the cinema, it's not necessarily going to be because they're, they're desperate to see that movie. They're going to be desperate just to go to the cinema. Just to be able to go there and watch any movie and have a bit of fun and have a bit of like sort of, you know, suspend your disbelief for 90 minutes whilst eating some popcorn. It's it's a real joy. It's an experience. Uh, and it's not just about the actual movie itself. I go to the cinema to see terrible films as well as good ones. It's not always my intention, but, you know, part of it's the cinematic experience to be able to sit there and just eat and popcorn go, this is a pile of shit. You know, that's just as much fun as going, this is fucking great. It's, that's me eating popcorn, by the way. I'm not, I don't lose my ability to speak clearly during movies. Although I should shut the fuck up. So, who knows. But yeah, that's that's basically um, where Disney is at the moment. They're, they're pulling their release dates for their films, but I don't know. I don't expect them to be new release dates for these two films in particular. I think these will go straight onto streaming platforms. And I hope so too, because I'm looking forward to seeing... I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing um, Free Guy. Um, one thing you'll definitely be able to watch on Christmas um, on the Disney Plus channel is the new Star Wars Holiday Special. Yes, almost 40 years after the original, which George Lucas cannot be blamed for, comes a brand new special from Lego. Lego. Yeah, Lego. Lego Star Wars. We haven't seen that properly yet. Um, we've seen Lego Batman, and we've seen the Lego movie, but yeah, actual Lego Star Wars Holiday Special. And um, here's the little synopsis that they've actually posted on online. Directly following the events of Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, Rey leaves her friends to prepare for Life Day, as she sets off on a new adventure with BB-8 to gain a deeper knowledge of the Force. At a mysterious Jedi temple, she is hurled into a cross-timeline adventure through beloved moments in Star Wars cinematic history. Coming into contact with Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Yoda... Obi-Wan, and other iconic heroes and villains from all nine Skywalker Saga films. But will she make it back in time for Life Day Feast and learn the true meaning of holiday spirit? <laughs> now, that's basically um, the synopsis of the, of the, the thing. It, it looks fun. Um, but I think one of the key things to pick up on here is the fact that some of the main actors haven't come back. Um, Ray is not going to be voiced by Daisy Ridley. Um, Finn is not going to be voiced by John Boyega, but we're not surprised about that one, considering his comments. Um, and Oscar Isaac also hasn't returned to play Poe Dameron. Um, so, yeah. Um, and the other voice actors are actually going to be from the animated series and not actually from the films either. So there, there are a few actors coming in. Anthony Daniels is going to be doing C-3PO. Um, your man there, the coolest, smoothest man in the universe who plays Lando Calrissian. Billy D. Williams. Jesus, I couldn't think of that one for a second. Billy D. Williams is returning to, to be Lando. But, yeah, we'll see. It looks a bit... It, it might be fun, and you know, the Lego films usually are quite fun, but um, this is definitely a bit of a, a cash grab. Um, so we'll we'll see if it's actually any good. Um, God knows I'm, I'm that much of a Star Wars fan that I'm just going to watch it, regardless. So um, I'll be sure to let you know what I think about it. Okay, that's pretty much it for the film news for now. Um, let's move on to the film reviews. <laughs> Hubie Halloween, Hubie, Hubie, Hubie Halloween, I, you know what I mean, I'm not entirely sure, Hub, let's call him Hubie, Hubie Halloween stars Adam Sandler as Hubie Dubois, a middle-aged man who lives with his elderly mother and is the most enthusiastic, albeit unappreciated, member of his community. And when Halloween comes about, the self-appointed Halloween monitor patrols the neighbourhoods where he is subjected to non-stop abuse and ridicule. Regardless of which, he continues to look out for the safety and well-being of everyone in his hometown. However, when a real threat to the public, an escaped mental patient who has a history with some of the town folk, escapes... Hang on. An escaped mental patient escapes? Does that mean he's been captured? I should really read this stuff carefully before I start reading it out. I'm the one that wrote it as well. I don't know. Fucking... Anyway, 
An escaped mental patient who has history of the town folk uh, is on the loose and Hubie must do his duty. But having already claimed that there was a werewolf on the prowl, he's not really winning them over. And as people start getting abducted all over town, he's running out of time to save the people of Salem. Now, this is an Adam Sandler film. I say that because I don't want this to be get get mixed up with the um uh the you know the other films that he does like Hidden Gems, which was the last one to drop on Netflix. This is one of his Happy Madison productions, and it has his usual arrive um friends and colleagues and former filmmates. Um you'll see Kevin James kind of phoning it in um and just I don't know I'm not sure Kevin James is funny anymore. He was for a while, but just like a one-trick pony. I don't think he's really kind of got much more to give. Um, And in this one, even though he's heavily disguised, it's still like that same kind of bland, understated, and then sometimes shouty, look at me, I'm a fat guy kind of comedy. It's it's kind of, I'm a bit tired of it now. Um, He's also got Rob Schneider in it, who turns up in a surprise role, but... It was kind of weird that I was surprised because I should have been thinking all the way through, through the film, like, sort of, who, where is Rob Schneider? Why isn't he in this? Um, but it does have a bunch of different surprising cameos. Um, Shaq, I think, definitely being the most surprising of all of them. Um, and what can I say about this film? It's um, a very predictable, obvious, um, you know, silly self-deprecating just nonsense film which doesn't really have much of a plot it's just a series of gags and toilet humor and funny voices and bad beards it's just it's one of those films however i have to say i enjoyed it um with the adam sandler films you kind of have to go in knowing what you're getting this isn't he's not trying to tell classic stories he's not trying to like sort of melt your heart with um lovely rounded characters um he can actually be a fantastic actor but not in films that he makes um and i don't think he's trying to i think there's been a lot of problems people have had with adam sandler over the years is that he keeps churning out bullshit films over and over again and people wonder why well, it's because he has an audience. Um, people really do enjoy these films, and as as crappy and half-assed and kind of amateur as they seem at times, they do have a certain charm to them. They do have a certain, as I say, self-deprecating, um, you know, innocence, which just tickles your funny bone enough to keep you coming back and watching more of them. Like, I can't tell you... Like, Happy Gilmore, I really loved. I thought it was a great film when it came out. Billy Madison, I didn't understand. Although there was this one time when my friend gave me a mushroom from Mexico. And I had a very weird afternoon, but watched Billy Madison again and, and somehow understood everything. Especially the penguin. I did, yeah, that was a weird night. I don't really know what's going on. Um, I think my mind may have been altered slightly. But I digress. Adam Sandler films are usually throwaway, trashy bits of comedy which are very suited to, to straight to VOD release. Um, and his deal with Netflix seems to be going on and on and on. Uh, they seem to be happy to keep making these films for him. But um, let's face it, I mean, he's a potential best actor nod at the coming the, the next Oscar ceremony for his part in Uncut Gems. And I do, I do say... He's a good actor. When he chooses to, he's one of the best actors in the world. If you want to see a great film, um, watch uh, Punch Drunk Love. It's a wonderful film. I should I should really review it on here because it's a hidden gem that I think a lot of people need to watch. I think it's um, Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, yeah. I think... You, I'll have to look into this. I'll have to give it some proper research, but... Uh, it's a fantastic film. I think it came off the back of uh, an Oscar-winning film he did with um, that Paul Thomas Anderson did with um, Daniel Day Lewis. I think it might have even been There Will Be Blood. Uh, when they said when he 
they asked him what he was doing next and he said, I'm doing an Adam Sandler comedy. Everyone laughed and thought he was taking the piss, but that's exactly what he did. And it was one of the most sincere and sweet and heartbreaking films I've ever watched. I absolutely loved it. And it was because of Adam Sandler's performance in that film. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll pick up that film and I'll, I'll cause I, you know, I'm just looking now. I don't actually own that film. I'm sure I had it on VHS, but, or, or DVD even. I don't know. How old is the film? I digress. Let's move on to our next film. Who Be Halloween is on Netflix now. If you want to catch it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those films you can just stick on in the background. It's kind of Netflix and chill vibe film, you know? It's, it's entertaining and it's funny, um, but it's not groundbreaking. It's not going to be a film that you're going to be talking about for years. It's just another one of those kind of, you know, disposable movies that will suffice for an evening. Um, yeah. But this is the thing. I was originally writing or like, writing these reviews or watching these films because I was going to do a Halloween special last week. And that didn't work out. So, more horror. Um with Train to Busan, which is a South Korean film about a workaholic father who is trying to return his daughter to his estranged wife in the city of Busan. Little do they know, a chemical spill at a biotech company has resulted in an outbreak of zombies. Although they seem safe enough on the train, one infected passenger begins attacking people, and before long, the train becomes a battleground of the living against the dead. After losing sight of his daughter whilst on a business call that he deemed a priority, he must reevaluate what is truly important to him and rescue her from another part of the train. But with carriage after carriage full of the undead, what chance does he have to succeed? Will he risk it all? Can he convince anyone who witnessed his bad parenting to help him? And can any of them survive long enough to reach their destination? Now, again, this is a film I watched... Um, last weekend with the anticipation of doing a horror special um and it's a film that i've heard about for a while and never really got around to to watching and knowing that the sequel actually came out um i think on friday um i really wanted to catch up with this and, and get it in now i'm very pleased i did because it's an actual it's a fantastic film and um it, it works on many different levels, actually, because it's a good horror film. I mean, you can imagine being trapped in a train, you know, and it's a train that's doing, what, like 150, 200 miles an hour? You can't exactly just jump off. And um, the truth of the matter is, it kind of reminded me of Snowpiercer in a way, because the different parts of the train, the different carriages, are different classes. You have a first-class carriage, you have a, like, um, second-class carriage, and... Um, you know, the further you go down, um, the more you get, like, sort of, you know... Well, there's there's an, an elitism to certain parts of the train where people feel they should be prioritised due to their standing in society and their contributions to the economy. Um, and this father figure, he finds himself... At, he was, he's one of those. You know, he's a he's a bit of a big wig at his company. Um, and he he's made a success by putting his family second and putting his business first. But when he really does find himself in a situation where he is the only hope his daughter has, he's got to pull himself together and reevaluate his priorities and work with people that may look down on him. But putting his ego to one side to do what's right becomes something which clarifies his, his thoughts and makes him focus on the task at hand. Um, I actually found this was a, a very enjoyable film. The pace of it is relentless, though. I mean, there is there is really there's, it's a bit slow to begin with, whilst they're kind of like building the stories. But really, just when you're thinking it's dragging, about five ten minutes into the film, it kicks off and it gets going and it doesn't stop. It's unrelenting in its pace and its desire to really strain every last nerve that you have. Um, the danger and the threat is constant and palpable throughout the film. Um, and the characters, there's some wonderful characters here. They don't really have a lot of time to develop and there's not really a lot of exposition, which is good, as you know, I don't really like that kind of shit. But what we do have is some very strong characters and some very interesting dynamics, which really make for, um, you know, the development of the relationship between these characters throughout the film becomes uh, a powerful motivator for their you know, their morals and, and their, their beliefs. 
you know, they they do put the greater good first rather than their own well-being. Although that's not to be said for all characters, and some selfish fools do cause a situation which put others in danger. So it's a very interesting one to watch that from a a cultural point of view as well. But it is just um, a full-on zombie film, um, and a very claustrophobic one at that. So if you do get a chance to check it out, I had to rent it on Amazon Prime, but it's definitely worth the money. I think it cost like £2.50. Train to Busan, it's a great, great horror film, and something slightly different. If you're used to all the Hollywood um, zombie films or the European ho- zombie films, this is one of the, the only Asian ones, um, and it's it's really, really good. The sequel has come out. I've heard it's fucking terrible, um, but I will give it a try because I need to know now. Um, but yeah, Train to Busan, check it out. Uh, very, very good. Very enjoyable. Um but very intense. Um, you know, might want to watch it with a stiff drink. Now, my last horror film for this week um, was one that just dropped on Netflix, and I didn't really see much about it, but um, I was flicking through, and I just I kind of saw it there, and it rang a bell, and I remember Matt Smith was in it, who was the former Doctor Who, one of my favourite Doctor Whos. Um, and, uh, yeah, I thought, you know what? Let's give it a try, because it was, it was original, I saw the concept of it. Um, it seemed quite original. So let me just break it down for you. His house is the story of two refugees from South Sudan who have been granted asylum by the government after arriving in England on a boat that capsized, resulting in the loss of their only child, a daughter who drowned. They're given a home to call their own and are advised to assimilate to their new surroundings as their residency is evaluated on a regular basis. Bol, played by Sope Derusu, and his wife, Rial, played by Wunmi Mosaku, M- Mosaku? Sorry, I'm butchering these, these names. Um, they do their best to settle in despite some tension with their neighbours. However, it's who they brought with them that causes real concern, as a demon begins to haunt and taunt the couple. Realising their home is at risk of being taken away and their right to stay in the country being revoked, the two must battle the demon without turning on each other. Now, basically, um, this film catches up with a couple who, despite the odds, have been successful in getting to their destination, but it wasn't without tragedy. It wasn't without a severe cost. And that's something that really does, like, it's a weight that they carry around that they can't really shrug off. But for the sake of putting on a good appearance and not wanting to have anyone cast a disparaging look or evaluating them as, like, falling apart... They put on a brave face and they don't grieve the loss of their child. Um, and soon the house that they're, they're put into becomes, well, it becomes ransacked by the actions of this demon. They're haunted by their own tragedy, but they can't quite figure out why they're being tortured and it takes a long time for them to really come to the realisation of what they've done, who they've become, and what they need to do to move on and move past it. Um, there's a lot for them to learn about whether this is really what they wanted in the first place, whether it's worth all of the the, the tragedy and the heartache, um, and whether the two of them can stay together and work as a team to really win over not only the government and the council and and the the social workers but to whatever it is that's haunting them to whatever it is that's fighting against them and trying to destroy what they have and it's a very unique story to kind of see this because it's it's um you know it's the the the, the spirits are basically traditional african like stories of of spirits and demons um regarding tragedy and and the fact that you try to own something which doesn't belong to you that you try to be something which you aren't this this deception uh, which causes a real conflict for them as they feel that they are being the people they need to be to get to where they need to get to um and they need to kind of come to some kind of conclusion. It's a very interesting story. It's a very deep 
and um, complex, uh, you know, narrative because they they really need to kind of they struggle to understand what it is they're trying to achieve, and they question their own actions as to what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, but they can't really be sure that they're even on the same page, the two of them. Um, and it puts a lot of stress on their relationship as well as their, their, you know, their safety and their future. Um, so it's a very unique film and a very unique perspective as well. There's a few things here that I haven't seen before in, in any film. Um, and it was a, you know, really a very, very gripping watch. I was sucked in and I, I don't remember blinking for the entire film. You know, it's not a very long film, um, but the story is amazingly engrossing and um, extremely unique. It was one of the most unique horror films I've ever seen. And some really outstanding performances. Um, now, with uh, with Wunmi, I've seen her in a, a bunch of film, films and TV series in the UK. She's quite well known. With Sope, who plays Bol, um, I haven't really seen him much before. The only thing I recognised him from... Uh, was Huntsman Winter's War. And the only reason I recognised him from that is because I was in that as well. And I remember being on set with him. Um, and it's kind of weird because when it's an unknown actor, you can sometimes like just like bounce some conversation off them uh, without really kind of like realising that you're... As a, as a um, supporting artist, you're not supposed to interfere with principal cast, but sometimes you don't actually know who's principal cast. And I've been I've been guilty of that so many times. There are soap operas I've worked on where I just start chatting with someone, and I get an AD saying like, "Can you um, just let them know their lines and stuff?" I'm like, "Oh, mate, you got lines?" And they're like, "Yeah, I'm, you know, one of the Fowlers or something in EastEnders." You know, it's just one of those things where I'm like, "I don't watch the show. I don't know who the fuck you are." Um, so unless the character's being played by a famous actor, I don't really know. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, Sope was a, uh, seemed like a very nice guy he seemed to be in very good spirits and it was very interesting to see him taking on a lead role he actually knocked it out of the park I thought he did absolutely very absolutely fantastically as the you know as the the, the beleaguered and embattled bull he's doing his best to assimilate and he's trying to do what he can he's trying to eat with cutlery he's trying to sing football songs down the pub but um, his his battle is be, is beyond that. It's not as simple as he thought it would be. His plan has to be rewritten. And um, yeah, great, great film. His House on Netflix now. Give it a try. I think you'll really, really enjoy it. Okay, uh, we have more for you. I know I normally finish the, the podcast around now because we usually stick to three films per episode. But because we missed out last week, I'm going to throw in a couple more for you. So... Um, yeah, exclusively available to purchase on Disney+. Plus. Mulan is the latest live-action remake of a classic Disney film of the same name. Following the footsteps of Dumbo and the Lion King, Mulan brings to life the tale of a young girl who steals her father's armour to take his place in the conscription for the military by pretending to be a man. She does this knowing her father, who was only blessed with daughters, would not have survived battle in his state being an old man who cannot walk without a stick. Rather than bringing dishonour and shame to the family, she goes instead. And having secretly trained in martial arts, she does well to keep up the charade. But as she hides her secret, she is troubled by her deceit, not only to her comrades, but to the family she left behind, unaware of her fate. Can she defeat her inner demons as she fights to save her emperor and defend her home? Now, I watched this film having not seen the animated original. Um, I was aware of the old Chinese um, proverb, if you will, uh, the story of Mulan, but um, wasn't really too aware of the story. Um, and yeah, I had... Uh, uh, an evening with a friend and her little son and we wanted to watch a, f a film and I got this up and I thought, you know, it's something I wanted to review anyway um, and watching it with more than one person kind of justifies the cost. Um, this is the thing, like, sort of with... Um, when you're spending, like, sort of 15, 20 quid in a film, you want to be able to keep that film. Um, but what usually happens is... Um, if you are taking a family to the cinema, 
you know, you're usually spending three or four times that amount because of the amount of tickets you've got to buy, the amount that costs, all the, the snacks and supplies and everything that comes with it. Um, and usually there's usually the case of like going for a burger or something beforehand. So taking film, t- taking kids to the to a film usually ends up being incredibly expensive. So shelling out a bit of money online, I can see how that's doable and it kind of justifies the cost because if you kind of put it all together, it's not such a big deal. I just don't think you can do the same for the Kenneth Branagh film. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Um, what did I think about this film? Well, first of all, it was, it was really nicely cast. I thought everyone in in the, the film was perfectly suited to their place. Um, I think it did a very uh, nice job of, you know, really showing, you know, the, the costumes and the, the set design was absolutely beautiful and all looked very, very traditional. Um, and it was a fun kind of jaunty jovial film which has a story of uh, heroism and being true to oneself and you know standing up for what you believe in and the kind of things that you want kids to hear when they're growing up and also it has a shitload of kung fu which is always fun i was having a good uh, conversation with uh, my friend aj shout out to aj um who was uh, recently received a box set of um, jet lee movies and I remarked the fact that as he was unwrapping the bubble wrap on uh, Instagram, before I could even see any detail in the case, I'm like, those are Kung Fu films. And I, I can't tell you why or how I knew that, but I could pretty much recognize the cover through bubble wrap. Now, I don't know how many Kung Fu films I've watched in my lifetime. I mean, we're talking a lot. Like I've worked my way through the Bruce Lee, um, Sammo Hung, uh, Donnie Yen, Jet Li, Jackie Chan, you know, everything, anything you can think of, even Cynthia Rothrock. I watched that. Every Everything that involves someone getting kicked in the face throughout the 80s and 90s, I pretty much watched it. And some of the stuff in the 70s as well. Um, as we got into the 2000s, it was mainly white people, like Keanu Reeves, so it wasn't as good. But, um, yeah... There's a lot of Kung Fu in this, and it's a lot of Chinese people doing Kung Fu, which is always great. Jet Li's in it, and Donnie Yen's in it. Although Jet Li didn't fight anyone. He did a little bit at one point, but not much. Um, Donnie Yen does his stuff. He's still awesome as hell. Um, I don't know if I told you the story of uh, when I met Donnie Yen. I was working on Rogue One, and I was waiting to meet the casting director. We were watching Mads Mikkelsen film his final scene. Um, and it's the bit where he's saying goodbye to young Jin Erso. Um, he gives her a hug. And yeah, as he was filming it, they had a film of, that, that, that are filming over the girl's shoulder and seeing his, his face as he embraces her. But they asked him to do it one more time as he looks up and just kind of shows a glimmer of emotion. Um, like just show the camera his heartache. And on cue, I, I swear to God, this motherfucker is so good. Um, he hugs the girl, and as he glances up to the camera, one solitary tear rolled down his cheek. On cue! One! One fucking tear! I, that's impossible. And um, I remember just... There was, supposed to, there was another actor stood beside me, who was the other guy up for the casting that I was there for. I remember just, like, just... I didn't even look to my side. I just nudged the person next to me. I said, fucking hell, he's good, isn't he? And that's when I heard this Chinese voice saying, he's a very talented actor. And I just slowly glanced to my right and I'd fucking elbow Donnie Yen. (sighs) Jesus Christ almighty. Um, Obviously, you know, I didn't attack him and no one in their right mind would. Um... But I just hadn't noticed that this guy stepped away and Donnie Yen, we were both watching monitors. There's a couple of monitors backstage and I just had one to myself and I was just watching this scene being filmed. I mean, what a privilege anyway. Let me tell you, to watch Mads Mikkelsen filming a Star Wars movie on set with Donnie Yen beside me. My life, I, I'm telling you, occasionally really fucking privileged. Just occasionally. But it was a wonderful moment. And it got it got better as well because, like, um, apologies if you hear any weird noise in the background. I've just noticed that fireworks are going off again. I'm not really sure what the fireworks are for right now because 
a lot of people were celebrating um, the end of the Trump era, but on bonfire night. So, you know, anyway, if you're not aware, by the way, America, um, and and shout out to America, by the way. Yeah, I know you guys love to listen. Um, if you're not aware, in England, on November 5th, we celebrate a terrorist attack, or an attempted terrorist attack. Um, there was a guy called Guy Fawkes who, with a bunch of his friends, um, came up with the gunpowder plot, where they put stacks and stacks and stacks of barrels of gunpowder under the Houses of Parliament with the intention of blowing it up with everyone inside being killed. This was thwarted and uh, the the explosion never took place. Um, and I think Guy Fawkes was hung, drawn, and quartered. I believe there was there was a, a, a whole load of torture put upon this man um, before he eventually died. Um, but weirdly enough, and I, I can't really explain why this came about, but because he didn't manage to blow up Parliament, we celebrate that by setting off gunpowder in huge numbers. We set off fireworks, we have big bonfires, like big bonfires. Like if you go on go on YouTube and look at British bonfires because you'll be fucking shocked. Some of them are bigger than actual tower blocks, bigger than like actual huge buildings. Um and it's a huge tradition. We even like sort of we would make up um uh like uh, dummies or like sort of uh you know manifestations of guy guy forks um which is basically just it, what the tradition was it would just be like a pair of trousers and a jumper filled with hay or straw and to make it look human and then you'd give it a head um you know like a scarecrow but you'd wheel it around you'd wheel it around your neighborhood and you'd say penny for the guy and people would throw pennies into the wheelbarrow and, you know, it's a bit like trick or treat, um, but much, much weirder because it's basically we're carrying around the corpse of a failed terrorist for pennies in a wheelbarrow, which we will then set off fireworks to celebrate. Later. It, you know, it's we're weird over here. We're a, we're a crazy country and we've been around a very long time. So a lot of our shit doesn't make sense anymore. But there we are. Let's, let's move on, though. Um, Mulan, I enjoyed, and it'd be great to watch with the family, but it's not like a groundbreaking film. It's nothing special, really. Um, and apparently there's a lot of problems with... Um, uh, there's a lot of cultural things happening in the film, which um, the people of China weren't too happy about. And there's been a lot of protests about it, so... It's up to you, really. If you want to watch it, give it a try. As I say, the kids will love it, um, especially if they like a bit of kung fu, and especially if you're trying to teach them like sort of good moral stories. Uh, this one teaches them, you know, don't try to be something you're not. You're you're the best version of yourself when you are yourself, and I think that's a lesson that all kids need to hear at some point. So if this is how they hear it, good stuff. But moving on to our final film, uh, we did mention it earlier. The Trial of the Chicago 7 is a courtroom drama from Aaron Sorkin, which is based on the real-life legal battle of the seven anti-war activists who are charged with crossing state lines with the intention of provoking violence towards the police and inciting a riot. As the defendants make their case, we relive the events that resulted in their arrest, and even though it was a great even though it was greatly accepted that the police were in fact the provo- provocateurs, I, see, this is the problem. I write these reviews and I put in nice fancy words that make me sound smart before I realise I don't actually know how to fucking pronounce them. Anyway, even though it was greatly accepted that the police were in fact the provocateurs, these young men are subjected to an incredibly biased and unjust trial that could result in them being imprisoned for bringing what they call merely ideas across state line and argue their innocence. Can justice be served when the system is rigged? One thing's for sure, with the current political climate, this is a story that needs to be heard and remembered as a lesson from the past. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to watch this was because it just had one of the most fascinating casts of any film I've ever seen that's gone straight to um, uh, VOD release. Now, as I say, this was supposed to be cinematically released earlier in the year, but because it's 2020, that didn't happen. And Netflix did the right thing. They went and bought the rights for it. 
um, and they put it out there, and it's had a lot of critical acclaim. Um, but really, once you start going through the cast on this film, I'm going to bring it up on my laptop here now, but I could start rattling off names immediately. Um, actually, I know I've got the cast right here, so let's just go through some of these names. Okay. So you've got um, Yahya abdul Malin II. He's a great actor. Sasha Baron Cohen, as you know as um, Borat. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who, as you know on this show, I'm a big fan of. Uh, Michael Keaton. Um, Frank Lagella. Uh, Eddie Redmayne. Mark Rylance. Um, you know, there's, there's so many people in this film. Um, in fact, I'm sure there's, there's much more than that. Because... The list just goes on and on and on. There, there are so many great actors in this film. Um, it's just a wonderful film to watch. And it means that every single character is performed with the level of, um, you know, ability and acting nuance that really gives them all a distinct amount of believability without anyone trying to outshine each other or steal the show. Sasha Baron Cohen who plays, um, what was his character's name? Abby something. Um, Abby Hoffman, yeah. He is a quite a, a larger-than-life character in the film, but his character was, his Abby was a very, very outspoken um, and very kind of, you know, he wasn't someone to be shut up. Um, and it was it was that which, it was that ability or, or that kind of characteristic which he used to kind of do a lot of good in the world and, and you know, try to the best of his ability to create, um, you know, feelings of um, mutual compassion and, and peace amongst people. It, you know, he was part of the uh, Youth Independence Party, I think it was, or the Yippies, as they were known. And they were a group of anti-war protesters uh, that were looking for, you know, social change. They were looking for um, a way of actually kind of stopping all of these innocent young lives being sent mercilessly to a, an unwinnable war, um, which was completely unnecessary. And in, in protesting that war, you know, him and his friends, they all got um, labelled as uh, domestic terrorists, basically. Um, and it was a, a terrible situation which they had to be put through. Um, but basically, um, you know, it, it's, it's a story that has kind of defined um, uh, political movements within America, and um, it did do a lot to change the way uh, protests were regarded from a legal point of view. Um, but it was also a story that was um, surrounded in tragedy as well. You know, um, people died, people were killed by police officers uh, just trying to stop, just trying to, like, um, you know, march for peace. Uh, and one of the points that's really brought up in the film is that if you try to deny people... A, a place or you know a safe environment to protest you push it out into the streets uh you you make it become um unorganized and um you can create panic in in you know groups that aren't organized it's it's a very weird situation but the problem which this film really does show is that um in a show of force the police became the antagonists and they created the violence they created the conflict um and in some instances, which are documented in this film, they would even go as far as to take off their police badges and ID, uh, signifying that they were acting above the law and taking justice into their own hands. Um, and, you know, as things have been developing in, in America in 2020, um, that kind of situation is still a huge problem, uh, especially in regards to, um, you know, the, the, the victimization of, of people of colour in the country. Um, and how in endangered for their lives they feel just in a simple police stop. Um, so there, there's some, you know, there's some um, mirroring of the current situation. Um, but this film does a really good job of really just symbolising what freedom and justice really means and how important it is to preserve those principles, especially in a country so big and so powerful. Um the world is watching is something that's chanted over and over again outside the courtroom. And it's still something they chant to this very day, um, which kind of brings us back to the whole presidential thing. Um, 
we need a, we need to create uh, an environment of calm, uh, an environment of compassion. Um, but it is not just on the side of the protesters that that action needs to happen. Um, the governments need to start recognizing the the power they have and um, stop treating protesters as the enemy when what they're looking for is equality and um, you know compassion. I keep saying the word compassion over and over again. It seems to be something that's been missing from politics for many many decades now. Um, and this film, I mean, p- happening in the beginning of the seventies or the end of the 60s, um, shows how little has actually changed in society. Um, but, you know, Alan, Aaron Sorkin is one of the greatest screenwriters alive right now, and he directs this film as well, and it's it's good. It's really, really good. Um, it's just over two hours long, but it doesn't feel like that. And the great thing about it being released on Netflix is a film that long. If you really need to just stop and stretch your legs halfway through, you can go and do that. Um, and I recommend you do that. I don't mean to go and stretch your legs. I mean, sit down, turn on Netflix and watch one of the films that I've recommended for you today, because there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, I say even the crappy ones still quite fun. Um, if you've ever enjoyed an Adam Sandler film, you'll probably enjoy Hubie Halloween. Um, but there you go. There's a good choice for you, for you there. And, um, hopefully that kind of makes up for the fact that I missed out on last week. Um, I do apologize. It's been a it's been a long time and new laptop has cost me a pretty penny, let me tell you. Um but it's been definitely been worthwhile and what I did was I kind of overpaid um because what I'm aiming to do is to eventually make some kind of content that can go up on YouTube. Now, admittedly this is actually going up on YouTube already. Um a static screen audio only version of the podcast is being released. Um, on YouTube, but I don't know. I'm intrigued as to like sort of making actual video, like actual original content for YouTube. So if you want to see that, give me a shout, let me know what you think. Um, I definitely have the technology for it now. Um, But yeah, next week is actually going to be a bit of a different episode. I mean, I know I'm talking about like doing Goldfinger and Punch Drunk Love, but next week... I'm not going to be reviewing movies. We're going to try something different next week. Next week, the following feature podcast is going to be a TV podcast. I'm going to be reviewing TV shows, including Truth Seekers on Amazon Prime. I'm also going to be looking at um, For All Mankind on Apple Plus. And I haven't quite decided on what my third series is going to be yet. But if you've got any suggestions, let me know. Um, yeah, I know there's a bunch of stuff on Netflix. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now, but there's a lot to watch. But yeah, we're going to try reviewing TV shows next week. If you like that idea, let me know. If you've got any suggestions, give me a shout. Um, and also let me remind you that I'm here for you regardless of what you want to talk about, be it films, be it TV shows, be it comics, be it politics, be it anything at all. If you've got no one to speak to as we go into this second lockdown, if you feel frustrated or just alone and you don't feel like the people around you would really understand where you're coming from, if you need an impartial voice and a compassionate ear, because you know I love my compassion, give me a shout. If you want to drop me a message, I'm on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. You can leave a message on the podcast if you want. Um, But don't suffer in silence. Uh, everyone has problems once in a while, and we get through these things quicker and better together. So you're not alone. You can always give me a shout. I'm always here for you. Anyone that ever wants to talk about anything at all, if you just want to speak up, and yeah, I can listen. But that's it for this week. Um, yeah, I've got an early night tonight because I'm getting up at, well, I think I've got to leave at five o'clock tomorrow morning in order to get to southwest London for a COVID test at 8.30. Um, there's a TV show I've been working on, and we've got some pickups to do on Wednesday, so I, I need to be ready for that, but it means I need to go for another test. Um, yeah, so very, very early night for me tonight. Um, but I'm glad to have the podcast back. I'm sorry it's been so long. I've missed you guys. I don't know if you've missed me, but... Um, 
uh, you know, until next week, I wish you peace, love, and empathy. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Enjoy your week. And enjoy your movies. Bye-bye.